Morning, church. Before I forget, Summit, you are dismissed. Yeah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Pastor Justin. I am the pastor of students and counseling here at Reclamation Church. If I've never got to meet you, it's great to meet you this morning. I always consider it a high honor to open God's word with God's people. So I'm thankful for this opportunity. We will be going to the book of Luke. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles, if you don't have one, there should be one underneath your seats. Though this is a familiar text, nonetheless, don't sleep on it. Charles Spurgeon is quoted saying, nobody ever outgrows Scripture. It only widens and deepens with our years. Found that to be true in my life and specifically with this passage. So that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And it reads, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But it's your word. I'll let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, for he... And all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. I pray that you would receive it as such this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come acknowledging today that we are a sinful people, undeserving of anything from you. But God, as we open your word today, I pray that you would speak to us. God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would grasp our attention And point our gaze to the beauty of your gospel. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The title of today's message is Caught by the Catcher of Catchers. In opening, I'd like to show you a painting. The painting on the screen behind me is entitled Wanderer Above the Sea Fog. The painting is by Caspar David Friedrich. He's a 19th century German artist. And the painting is of a breathtaking landscape of rising fog among the valley with the mountain ranges off in the distance and a man standing on the precipice of a rock formation looking out over this awe-inspiring scenery. The landscape is truly overwhelming, and much can be said about it, yet there's this man who's in the way that we must vicariously view the scenery through. Who is this man, and what is he doing at the top of this mountain range? Those and many other questions can be asked, but this compositional device is not uncommon for a Frederick painting. It's commonly referred to as a Ruckin figure, which means a figure seen from behind. 
The Ruckin figure here has a noble stance. The way he stressed his hair, his cane, all these little details alert us to the fact that we're going to have to identify with this man before we can identify with the meaning of the painting through the painter. There are many things to be said about the man on the mountain. Many people have theories of who this man was. But I'm sure you didn't come here to talk about a painting this morning, right? Nonetheless, I'd like to invite you to view the scriptures through Luke's ruckin' figure this morning. Because there's all types of imagery that can be associated with this scripture, and these things are beautiful and exciting. But sometimes I think that we can dive so deeply into the imagery that we romanticize things and we miss the experience. We miss the struggle. We miss the humanity of our ruckin' figure, Peter. So if you're willing, let's zoom in and attempt to experience the awe-inspiring landscape of Jesus through the life and the eyes of Peter. And then we will end with some application for our own lives. For starters, we must acknowledge that Luke's gospel is certainly a unique account. Luke, as we come to know in the book of Acts, which is volume two of his works, is a physician by vocation, but a historian in his writing style. His intention in writing his account seemed to be a little different than the other gospel writers, and we're confronted with this immediately upon reading his introduction. We see that Luke spells it out for us. His intention is to write an orderly account for a man named Theophilus. We're not exactly sure who Theophilus was, but many have speculated that he was a high-ranking official in the Roman army, came to faith, and wanted to hear more about this Jesus guy and the events that took place in his life. This would have been important for Greeks in Luke's time to have an orderly account, preferably chronological order. This is what their historians did. They researched, obtained sources, and put everything into a neat unfolding catalog for the readers to experience for themselves. And as I stated, this is not necessarily the priority of the other gospel writers. The reason I keep bringing this up is due to our story here today. Many have assumed that because of the ordering of Mark's account that this is Jesus' first encounter with Simon Peter. But according to Luke's orderly account, our assumptions would be wrong. We see that this incident at the shores of Gennesaret followed Jesus' baptism in chapter 3, verse 21. We see that it follows his temptation in chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And then, at the end of chapter 4, we see that Jesus has a brief solo mission where he taught in the temple as well as performed some radical miracles, including the casting out of demons and the healing of many people. In chapter 4, 38 through 39, Luke tells us that during this brief solo mission in Capernaum, Jesus makes a pit stop to Peter's house and heals his mother-in-law of a high fever, and she immediately gets up and begins to serve him like nothing ever happened. After this, Luke tells us in chapter 4, verse 42, that Jesus' fame had spread all throughout Galilee to the point that he had to escape into a desolate spot because people were trying to corner him trying to keep him from leaving. They had witnessed him do miracles in his powerful teaching, and they wanted more. So once again, though it appears that Jesus just walks up and hijacks Peter's boat without any initial introduction, this simply would not have been the case, according to Luke. Peter would have heard of Jesus. He would have seen him already at work firsthand prior to this scene. And obviously... So did the crowds of people along the way. This brings us to Luke chapter 5, verse 1, where Jesus finds himself surrounded by an eager mob on the shore. Luke tells us they were pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Wouldn't that be a sight to see? And just as it begins to get too close for comfort, boom, Jesus sees two boats. One happens to be Peter's. Jesus decides he's going to sequester him in his services for the afternoon. Now, Luke tells us that Peter and the others had just got back in from a long night of unfruitful fishing. And they were literally in the process of packing up to go home. Verse 2 tells us that they were washing their nets. 
I'd like to take a moment to hop into the psyche of our rucking figure, Peter, here, just for a moment, because it's very easy to read past this scene due to Luke's few words, but there's a lot to unpack here, at least in, in my mind. If we put ourselves in Peter's shoes, he just spent somewhere around eight hours, give or take, on his boat, literally just got in. In this place in time period, they fished at night mainly because they used these massive three-layered weighted nets that would be extremely visible during the day. So to catch the fish off guard and to get the fish caught in the net without being able to get out, they fished at night. But though Peter and his crew were in the right place at the right time, with the right technique, they didn't catch a thing. They more than likely docked their boats that morning feeling pretty defeated. Feeling as though they probably wasted their whole night. Physically, mentally tired from the process of casting these heavy nets and reeling them back in over and over and over again with no catch. This would have had anybody ready to count their losses, go home, and sleep it off. Except there's this Jesus guy bringing a crowd of people to the shore just as they're getting ready to leave. I don't know about you, but after a night like that, the last thing I want to see is a crowd of people beginning to walk towards me. Think about it. Be like working an entire night shift, knowing that you got paid for none of the hours you just worked only to pull up into your driveway and the entire town is on your front lawn. Especially that guy that likes to talk about fertilizer for 45 minutes. No offense, Greg. Now, as bad as that would be, it's still much better than getting the call to go back into work for another shift. But that's exactly what we see happens. We see that Jesus hops in Peter's boat and gives him no choice but to go for a ride. Now, I don't know if Peter felt some sort of obligation to give Jesus a ride because he healed his mother-in-law, but most guys I know would have been pretty upset if Jesus healed their (laughs) mother-in-law. But that's another story. Why he agrees, we're not really told, but off they go. Now, something to understand about a first century Galilean fishing boat, if you could put that boat up there for me, is that they were at least a two-man operation, okay? They could be up to 26 feet in length with oars set at the front of the boat, the sail in the middle, and then they would have the steering device, the rudder, in the back. Now, that's a pretty big boat to row against the current by yourself. Why do I say that? While we can't be sure, some commentators have speculated that it was just Jesus and Peter because we're never told that anyone else is in the boat until the catch comes. The words they, their, them, we throughout this account are not present in the Greek, but they're simply implied in the English. That being said, it would appear that when Jesus tells Peter to put the boat out a little bit from the shore, Jesus hopped in the back to steer and teach. It's an illustration all of itself. Nevertheless, even if there were others in the boat, you can still feel the frustration building, right? You can still feel the tension in the air. Good, because it gets better. Jesus finishes up his teaching from his recently hijacked sea pulpit, which I'm sure Peter's hoping is finally his, his opportunity to dip out, right? But Jesus makes one last request. Verse 4. Here's my paraphrase. Put your net back out there, Peter, so you can catch some fish. Now, the first request, using his boat, though it was hard to accept due to the nature of the night prior, still feasible in Peter's mind, right? He could wrap his head around it. It made sense. Jesus needed some help escaping the crowds. But the second request was probably a lot harder to digest. In fact, I would say it was downright humiliating. Letting Jesus use his boat to perform his vocation of teaching was one thing, but for Jesus to come into his area of expertise and begin to tell him how to operate, it's a whole other story. This is crossing the line. 
Though Jesus was a good teacher and seemed to be performing miracles, he was no fisherman. And just as in any time period and culture, a man's vocation is more than just a hobby. It's his livelihood. It's what he's good at. It's a piece of his identity. And Jesus is basically challenging that in this moment. But let's not forget, it isn't just Jesus and Peter on a boat with no one around. There's a massive crowd of people watching. They saw Peter and his crew come in empty-handed. They saw the look of failure and defeat on their faces as they washed their empty nets that morning. And I think it's safe to assume that they're all intently watching and listening as this takes place. To me, it seemed like this Jesus guy's rubbing it in. It's little. Feel the humiliation? Do you feel the, the skepticism and the desire for this interaction to just be over in Peter's response? Check out verse 5. Master, this is how I'm reading it. Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But it's your word. I'll let down the nets. You ever do something just to shut somebody up? Like, you know it's not going to work. You're like, sure, I'll humor you, right? If you have kids, I'm sure you do it quite often. Um, <clears throat> I think that's what's going on here. But it was, it was at this moment that Peter's perspective of pessimism was met powerfully with the presence of God. Because Peter caught more than a net full of fish, he caught a glimpse of the glory of the Lord. So many fish come piling in that we're told the nets were bursting at the seams. And Peter jumps right into autopilot fisherman mode and frantically calls the other boat to come and help him land this catch. He's amazed. He's overwhelmed. He gets caught up in the moment and his fisherman reflexes snap into action and he begins to attempt to land this massive amount of fish. And then his mind finally caught up to what had just happened, and it clicked. And we see this filthy fisherman begin to fluently quote Scripture. If you look at verse 8, we see that Peter falls on his face and begins to echo a sentiment from a very well-known passage of Scripture, Isaiah 6. When Isaiah, in a vision, finds himself in the midst of God's presence, the foot of his almighty throne, and as he looks around, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe is filling the temple, speaking of the magnitude of his majesty, with these six-winged heavenly beings called seraphim flying above the throne, screaming out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, to which Isaiah, like Peter, cries out, Woe is me, for I am lost. Peter felt the fear and the awe of the Lord in that moment. And after a night of missing the catch, Jesus communicates his awesomeness to Peter in a way that even he couldn't miss it. Fish. Verses 9 through 10, we're told that everyone that was with him that night prior was there to witness this miraculous event, and they were astonished. The word for astonish is actually two words in the Greek. The one means seized. The other means amazed. So think of them just standing there, frozen, eyes wide, jaws dropped, in complete amazement. And Jesus then looks down at Peter on his knees and in fear and trembling over his sinfulness, Instead of casting condemnation on Peter, Jesus tells him to fear not. That he's going to be transforming his vocation from catching fish to catching people. The wanderer in the sea fog, Luke 5, these all remind me of a story I've heard 
from when our church was in its early days. The reason it reminds me of this is because it's a story that you can't truly appreciate, appreciate without some of the finer details. The church at this point didn't have a building to meet in, so they would host their core group meetings wherever they could find a space. They had a meeting scheduled in the park, but the forecast was calling for rain, so they were scrambling to find an alternate location. I'm sure that was frustrating, such a short notice. I believe it was Vicki France who was making the calls, and she landed on a bowling alley. Sounds like a Vicky move, right? Though the bowling alley wasn't in their plan, certainly wasn't their first pick, little did they know that God would use the bowling alley as a fishing vessel that day. The manager of the bowling alley was a young woman, around 20-something years old, and she was going through a tough time in her life. She had plenty of ups and downs over the past few years. She had just gone through a breakup, the long-term relationship she had with a boyfriend who just happened to fall into heroin addiction. Oddly enough, after they split ways, she had, he had an encounter with Jesus, and, and his life was transformed. She watched his transformation from afar, and she couldn't help but wonder if God could do the same in her life. She wasn't really religious, yet because of the work she saw God do in her ex-boyfriend's life, she had a unique feeling that maybe God was calling her to get involved with a church, of all things. She thought that maybe she could find some guidance there, people that could truly care for her. But time after time, every church that she walked into, she didn't feel welcome. No one would engage her. She felt completely out of place, so she just gave up. Maybe what God had done in her ex-boyfriend's life was a fluke. Maybe church wasn't the answer to her problems after all. Until one day, she was about to leave work around 4.30. When her shift ended, she had scheduled a young man to work the next shift. And then she gets a call. She's about ready to leave. And guess what? The kid's calling off sick. She has to go back in to work a double shift for this guy. Once again, surely wasn't in her plans. Certainly frustrating. She goes in, and while she's working the concession stand, this super energetic lady pops up named Lori Tanisha. (laughs) Approaches her and asks her, hey, are you a part of a church? To which she reluctantly replied, no, but I'm kind of looking. Lori proceeds to invite this young woman to one of the church's meetings, and the rest was history. She started to attend. She felt loved. She heard the gospel faithfully preached there, and she came to a recognition of her sin and her need for a Savior. She was one of the first to be baptized in this church. Now, the crazy thing about this story is that had not all this happened just the way it did, probably wouldn't be here standing before you preaching the Reclamation Church because that young woman is now my godly wife, and mother to our three children. And that heroin addict boyfriend is me. We're here at Reclamation Church. We're here at Reclamation Church all because Jesus got in the way of everybody's plans. Isn't it just like Jesus to barge into our lives at the wrong time and the wrong circumstances, in the midst of our real and perceived failures, stepping over our ignorance and our pride in order to mercifully show us his glory. Some have compared Jesus to a gentleman gently inviting himself into our lives. That's cute. But that's not at all. My wife's story certainly is not my story, and I don't think Peter would agree either. I think if Peter had a choice, he would have been at home sulking over the long, wasted night of no fish had Jesus not barged his way into his boat. All that being said, I'd like to connect a few observations from our text to our lives as we close today. That doesn't mean it's going to be quick. Number one, God knew where your boat was before he ever stepped foot in it. 
Jesus knew Peter had an unsuccessful night. Even the crowd could see that as they washed their empty nets on the shore that morning. But Jesus knew of Peter's failures far before he ever met him face to face. And the beautiful thing is, he still invited him into his boat, whether he was welcomed or not. Jesus wasn't afraid to associate himself with a filthy failure of a fisherman. He wasn't intimidated by Peter's lack of energy or pessimism because his transforming power was never contingent on Peter's track record. In fact, we wouldn't be talking about this story if Jesus helped a fisherman who had an incredibly successful night. We wouldn't be talking about the catch had his boat not showed up barren that morning. The same can be said about you. If you docked an empty boat here this morning, guess what? Welcome to the Failed Fisherman's Club. You are now officially ready to have Jesus step into your boat. The only prerequisite to having an encounter with Jesus is that you dock an empty boat as you come to the shore of God's grace. That you recognize that you have nothing to offer Jesus. And that's okay. Because that's the only way he steps into people's boats. If that's you for the first time this morning, welcome to our church. We're glad you're here. I'd love to have a conversation with you about Jesus after this service. But for those of us who it's not our first time, church, are you still docking an empty boat? And if not, I ask you this. What present circumstances or past failures are making you reluctant to docking that empty boat this morning? Which leads me to my next point, number two. Jesus doesn't need an invitation. He doesn't need your talents. He doesn't need your abilities. What he wants is your heart. Do you think that if Jesus wanted to pick an all-star team, he could have had them, right? If he was looking for talent, if he was looking for ability, he would have started with the Pharisees, not a bunch of busted up fishermen. But the truth is, he needs no one. He can operate completely independent of any human talent and effort. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he is the supplier and sustainer of our talents and efforts. And yet... We see that Peter looks to him and explains all that he had done the night prior. Explains his talents, his efforts, before he reluctantly casts the net. Oh, how often do we find ourselves in Peter's shoes, explaining to God why his way isn't going to (laughs) work. How we've already tried that before. But Jesus didn't ask Peter what he did last night. He he didn't ask Peter for his expertise. He just told him to cast the net. He invited Peter to trust him. And rightfully so. Because we see it a thought. The fish of the sea leaped to their death to sacrifice themselves in the nets in order to obey him. Yet here we are, looking for an explanation doing risk assessment before we make a move. Jesus desires to have an encounter with us, church. He goes out of his way to invite himself into our boats. It's because he knows we're enslaved to our own pride and our own strength. So he calls us to no longer cast our nets at night, but to cast our nets in the light of the sun, to walk by faith, not by our feelings or our sight. He will settle for nothing less than having our hearts. He calls us to trust him. So I ask you, what in and of yourself are you trusting in more than Jesus today? Because it's silly. Number three, you cannot truly encounter the depths of Jesus without also encountering the depths of your sin. You may have been puzzled at Peter's response the first time you read through this passage. 
may have thought, shouldn't he be happy that God blessed him with all those fish? Yet we see he isn't happy. Instead, he begins to weep over how sinful he is and tells Jesus to get away from him. What is that about? Isn't that odd? Actually, no, it's not. Though you won't hear this in most modern evangelical churches, make no mistake, this is the proper response to recognizing he was in the presence of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, you'll never make yourself feel that you are a sinner because there's a mechanism in you as a result of sin that will always be defending you against every accusation. We're all on very good terms with ourselves, and we can always put up a good case for ourselves. Even if we try to make ourselves feel that we are sinners, we'll never do it. There's only one way to know that we are sinners, and that is to have some dim, glimmering conception of God. This is our problem, church. This is why we could sit through a whole sermon and say to ourselves as we're walking out, I know somebody who needs to hear that. You! Yeah, you need to hear it. I need to hear it. We shouldn't be sitting in church on Sundays thinking about somebody else's sin. We should be thinking about our own. People who encounter God in the Bible are made painfully aware that they have no business being anywhere near Him. It's why Adam and Eve hid in the garden after they sinned. It's why the Israelites hid from Moses' shining face after their idolatry. It's why Solomon says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Why? Because it's smart to recognize the difference between you and a holy God. In order to encounter the holiness of God in the face of Jesus, you must recognize the reality of your sinfulness. Jesus in this chapter alone goes on to illustrate this point in his ministry. Verses 12 through 16, he heals a leper. Verses 17 through 26, he heals a paralytic. Verses 27 through 28, he calls Levi the tax collector. What do they all have in common? They all recognize their deficit. They recognize they were lacking something in the presence of Jesus. People who have it all together, or at least people who think they do, don't approach Jesus like this. They don't walk in repentance, as Tim was saying. We see this in verse 29 through 32, while Jesus is sitting at the table with a crew of tax collectors. The Pharisees show up with a complete lack of reverence or desire for Jesus. Listen to their question. They ask, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You see the problem? What they should have asked is, can we join your table? Can, can we sit with you too? But they didn't. Listen to Jesus' response. Those who are well, have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's absolutely crucial that Peter see that he is completely unworthy to be in Jesus' presence. Because without the proper fear of God, which is due to our understanding of our own sinfulness, we will never hear the words of Jesus to Peter, which is fear not. You cannot be comforted in your fear if you don't fear him. You cannot be healed of your sickness if you ignore your symptoms. You cannot be forgiven of your sins if you think that you're righteous. The truth is, is that we are all sick and sinful and should be in fear. We should respond to Jesus like Peter. And if we do, there's good news. Jesus says, fear not. I have paid your restitution. I've come to make you new. But this is not just the gospel for beginners, ladies and gentlemen. This should be ongoing. It is repentance that keeps us close to God without fear, not denial of sin, and certainly not perfection. 
and we no longer hit our knees in humble recognition of how good he is to bad people, us. Of how gracious he is to the ungracious, us. How patient he is to those who have no patience for others, us. Then we must ask ourselves, why? It must be that we acquired an attitude of entitlement along the way when it comes to God's grace. This is a dangerous place to be. It leads us to be blind to the goodness of God in our lives. So I ask you, is this your attitude? Are you, are you on your knees before Jesus? And if not, what is stopping you from experiencing the awe and the wonder of the undeserved goodness of God in your life? as he whispers in your ear, fear not. Number four, there are plenty of fish in the sea, but they all die on the beach. If you've been a Christian long enough, I'm sure you've heard this passage twisted into a message of something along the lines of, if you follow Jesus, your life will be filled with so many blessings that your boat will sink. Which I always found interesting because though the catch was miraculous, though it certainly cued Peter in to Jesus being more than just your average rabbi, verse 11 tells us that upon reaching the dry land, he left everything. It doesn't say that he took the fish to the market and cashed in. It doesn't say that he sold his boat and his equipment before he took off. It just says that he left everything. Ladies and gentlemen, as you walked in here and you're hearing this story and you're walking away with anything but Jesus being the big catch, then you missed it. While walking with God always means provision, it, it really means material abundance. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm just saying it's rare. And even then God gives in order for it to be given away. So if you have been told to follow Jesus for material cash out, I'm sorry that you've been lied to like that. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that though we may suffer, though we may be poor, though we may have hardships, though there may be sickness, though there's disorder and dysfunction in this fallen world, we have come to see Jesus as more wonderful, as worthy of our affection more than anything else in this world. Because we've come to believe that Jesus died to pay for our sins. Jesus gave the powers of darkness their final notice and that Jesus will one day come back and set it all straight. Then we will have new bodies that don't get sick. Then we will have riches that never fade. Then we will live in a new creation that is void of sin and Satan. But for now, we know the sufferings we endure pale in comparison to the glory that will be revealed when he comes back. That's the gospel. For now, we echo Peter's actions and Paul's words. We consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord, for whose sake we have lost all things. We consider them garbage. Love it. Why? So that we may gain Christ. This is what caused Peter to leave the catch and go to the cross. Do you think he was counting fish as he hung on a cross upside down at the end of his life? No, sir. Peter burned the dead idol of success on the beach that morning in order to follow the true and living God. So the question is, is what's keeping you on the beach with the dead fish instead of following Jesus? Because despite what you've been told, the scriptures are clear, the call is concrete, you haven't been called to count dead fish. Point number five. If you've encountered Jesus, the mission is no longer about the fish. It's about the people. Little did Peter know of the call that would be laid on his life when he washed up on the shore that morning. But with all that he had witnessed, he couldn't help but realize that everything in his life was about to change. Even his vocation. Peter started out frustrated that a man who was clearly not a fisherman would tell him how to fish. Oh, the nerve. 
until he found out that man was, in fact, the God who created all things. So by the end of our story, we see that Jesus not only shows Peter how to fish, but we see that he also shows him that he will never view fishing quite the same ever again. That's what happens when you encounter Jesus. Everything changes. All things in our life become allegories and parables in the hands of Jesus, even our worst nights of fishing. Jesus showing Peter that not only did he think he knew what he was doing, yet he didn't. He's showing him that he didn't even truly know why he was doing what he was doing. God had allowed him to pursue a career of fishing specifically for that moment. That he may be able to connect his past with his future mission. In the hands of Jesus, not only do our vocations become a vehicle for the gospel, not only do our failures become freight trains to freedom, but our greatest sins become swords in the battle for souls. The best way to tell people about Jesus is to tell them what he saved you from. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have accounts of how Jesus snatched his disciples up from earthly emptiness and gave them kingdom purpose. The book of Acts tells about how the Apostle Paul stopped dead in his tracks from killing Christians to being transformed into making Christians. What? These stories still live on to this day, and we've spent all morning talking about one because these stories are powerful, because it tells of sinful men being saved by a gracious God and set on mission for his glory. This has always been the best way to communicate the gospel to a sinful world, to show the crowd how Jesus can redeem a fishless night. So I ask you, church, what are your fishless nights? What is it that God has allowed to take place in your life that you rather didn't in order to redeem it and use it for bait? There are people who need to hear the story of your fishless nights before Jesus stepped into your boat. Your sin and rebellion towards God is the black velvet backdrop to the diamond of the gospel. But do you know what dims the gospel? When you act like you've never had a fishless night. When you make the gospel the backdrop to the diamond of your strength. If you wonder why you're not catching people, it's probably because you're still asking why Jesus sits with sinners. The common ground that every human being shares is the fact that we're all broken and need a Savior. You could go anywhere in the world not even speak their language, you're going to need a translator, but not even speak their language and be able to communicate something about that. And the best way to do it is to do it through your own story. The last thing this world needs is another embellished fishing story, ladies and gentlemen. Last thing this world needs is another motivational speech. What they need is something they can relate with. And that's the gospel in our testimonies. Satan would love for you to hide it, to act like it never happened, and to be ashamed of it. But God would love to take it and transform it into bait. For the glory of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the catcher of catchers. Reclamation Church, I challenge you to be on mission and bring people into the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning acknowledging that we don't deserve to be in your presence. Acknowledging that we over and over again try to tell you how to fish. Lord, I pray that you would mold our hearts so that we would begin to trust more and more in you and less and less in ourselves. Lord, thank you that you take our ashes and make something beautiful out of them. That there's nothing that is lost. 
in view of the gospel. The gospel that tells us that the death of your son was used as a vehicle for our salvation. Allow that to motivate us whenever we feel trampled, whenever we feel defeated, whenever we feel like Satan is winning. God, allow us to remember the gospel. Thank you for your son who died for a wretch like me. God, help us to use these magnificent stories of you catching us to catch others. Help us to be on mission. Help us to see the needs around us. Help us to engage our neighbors all for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, grateful to be with you this morning. I pray that you would be on mission for the Lord as you go out today and know that you are loved.